Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Horton. Uh, I'm editor of the medical journal, The Lancet, and it's a great pleasure to have you here today. Um, we have, uh, uh, in the past, we've had a press conference each day, um, and this time we're holding one press conference, uh, and we have a distinguished panel with us to whom you can pose your questions. Uh, let me just um, very briefly uh, introduce our panel, and then I do want to say just one or two opening remarks. Um, you already know, of course, Professor Detlev Ganton, um, who is the founding president of the World Health Summit. Uh, Professor John Wong, who is indeed the president of the World Health Summit, and you, if you were at the opening ceremony just now, the opening symposium, you will have seen both of uh, both Professor Ganton and Professor Wong speaking. We have three additional uh, highly distinguished colleagues with us today, and let me introduce them. Professor Aaron Chichinova is a Nobel laureate in chemistry from 2004, and we're very, very grateful that he's been able to join us today. Uh, Jose Ramos Horta is the Nobel Peace Laureate from 1996, and thank you very much indeed, President Ramos Horta, for being with us. And my great friend, Jeanette Vega, who is the Managing Director from the Rockefeller Foundation, responsible for health programs at the Rockefeller Foundation, and Jeanette has a distinguished career in global health, uh, having worked both at the global level in the World Health Organization and in her country, Chile, um, working hard for universal health coverage and health equity. Now, if you were at the uh, lecture that was just held uh, by Kishore Mahubani, um, you will have heard a remarkably optimi optimistic scenario of the future. Uh, and one of the things that he said in his lecture was how important it was that this community here at the World Health Summit can provide unique moral and political leadership, um, really that no other community can offer. And that is actually so important right now because the world geopolitically is at a critical transition as we come to the end of the Millennium Development Goal era and move into what we're calling the Sustainable Development Goal era. That is a big, not just a political change, but also a huge conceptual change. Sustainability is about all of us. It's not just about a few of us. Sustainability is about paying attention to future generations as much as we pay attention to to today's generations. So this requires perhaps a very different way of thinking, politically, economically, socially, and also in terms of the way we do health and science. The World Health Summit has established itself over the past five years as a critical point where different communi communities can come together to discuss these issues, the science and health communities and the policy and political communities. But as you will see from research that's being published this week, there is a huge gap, uh, a huge gulf between the investment in the research and development and the needs of communities in the world. In truth, the investment that's taking place in research and development today does not match the huge burden of poverty-related disease and neglected diseases. So we cannot afford to be complacent. I have a question to ask each of our panelists, and I'm going to answer, ask them to answer it as briefly as we can so we have a little time for discussion with you. And the question is a simple one. What do you feel are the biggest challenges facing world health today? And what contributions do you see science as being able to make to those challenges? And I'm going to begin with Professor Ganton. Thank you, Richard. If you would have told me this question before, <laughs> it would have been easier to answer. Um, <clears throat> well, what are the biggest challenges and what can we do about it? I think, to me, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, essentially, and with a, um, growing age, I realize just doing science, as Aaron probably will <laughs> confirm, is possibly not enough. So, uh, I mean, science is making enormous progress in all the fields, in medicine and many other fields. But the science is not brought to fruition, and certainly biomedical sciences and, and uh, the life sciences, the results are not translated into a 
health of the world population, the seven billion people uh, who are waiting for uh, the benefits of this science. So this is uh, kind of the, the, the great challenge, and this, if I may say so, is my motivation um, starting a new career in global health, rather than staying in the laboratory and shaking, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, chemical reactions and so on. So this is the challenge, and uh, of course, this cannot be done by uh, uh, health is not a medical problem. Uh, perhaps five or ten percent is medicine. The rest is ninety percent is something else. <coughs> It's politics, it's governance, it's uh, money, it's health economy, it's civil society, it's, uh, you know, the environment you work in. So we can only achieve what we need to achieve, uh, bringing the results of science to better health in the pop world population if we work together. And this is uh, the uh, raison d'etre of the World Health Summit. This is our ambition. And, uh, of course, I'm very happy that this panel kind of represents the various groups which uh, we need the help of to uh, achieve what we have to achieve. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Detlev. Professor Wong. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Mm. I would probably say um, the single biggest challenge that we have um, is how to change behavior. Because uh, behavior probably accounts for 40, that's 40, 40% of preventable death. Um, so if we are going to change behavior, um, and that has many second order implications, um, uh, what can the global scientific community offer? I think it can offer the scholarship so that people can change behavior based on good science and not because of myth. Science can provide the platform, such as the World Health Summit. And science can provide the leadership that Professor Mabubani earlier on mentioned to get people from different branches of science to come out of their cabins to work on a collective, a collective problem which is far bigger than any one institution or any one country or any one government can handle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Wong. Um, let me turn to President Ramos Horta now. Uh, of course, the, it is a jigsaw. It's uh, far too complex, uh, but uh, I would dare to say uh, Education, education and education uh, of our communities, uh, societies, uh, peoples. Only uh, uh, educated, informed uh, people from uh, uh, kindergarten, uh, childhood to adulthood can have an understanding of the importance of preventive uh, health. Uh, <coughs> only people who uh, are educated uh, can have uh, access to uh, dissemination of information that uh, governments and institutions make available in terms of how to prevent cholera, uh, etc. <coughs> uh, having said that, unfortunately, tragically, uh, uh, almost every developing country uh, make the same mistake like everybody else in that uh, you have an increasing urban uh, population, uh, partly, uh, not only, but partly or mostly because of concentration of uh, investments, uh, opportunities, and everything else, government services in the capitals. So you uh, suddenly, over a few years, you see population in cities double without to, uh, the possibility of anyone, even if you have the best government, then to have a corresponding uh, uh, facilities. 
And uh, then you have uh, rural areas uh, either abandoned uh, or taken over agricultural land taken over by industrialization. Uh, rampant, I call it rampant industrialization. With it come uh, health hazards. So it is, a, as I say, a jigsaw. Uh, only the right policies and the strong leadership uh, can address this. But I would say uh, uh, there are uh, areas where uh, people can, uh, themselves in the communities, can do to reduce, uh, to, uh, reduce uh, health problems. If a community simply engage in uh, cleaning up the community, don't throw garbage everywhere, don't have uh, pigs and goats and uh, dogs running everywhere, uh, that alone would diminish problems of malaria, of uh, diarrhea, of cholera, and uh, would then uh, diminish the health budget. You know, in uh, some countries, including my own, I was president, prime minister for my country, I engage physically every Friday, mobilizing thousands of people to clean up the barrios, the streets. <laughs> and uh, I would say, well, go to the hospital and you see, every rain season, uh, malaria, dengue cases go up. Why? I said, you, parents, it's your fault. You are the ones who are not teaching your children. You are the ones in the communities who don't do your share. So it's a, it's a monumental uh, task that I say, I think, in, to simplify, goes back to education. Thank you very much indeed. And as I say, we'll have qu time for questions in a moment. But let me ask Professor Chichinova for his comments on these issues of the challenges we face today and the contribution that science can make to those challenges. I see that you left the lady last. Um, I think that as I see it, because I'm, I happen to be in science, but I'm a physician by education, there are two main uh, issues facing medicine uh, these days. One is obviously scientific, and this holds mostly for the developed countries, uh, where scientists and physicians are pushing the frontiers of science to solve the diseases of the old age, the degenerative diseases. And the degenerative diseases are heart diseases, vascular diseases, brain diseases, and malignancies. Malignancies typical uh, age-related disease, and the war is carried out in institutions, in research institutions, and then in the pharma companies, and so on and so forth, and this is the very forefront of science. But this pertains only to part of the world. The other part of the world doesn't enjoy at all what we see in science. There are hundreds of millions of people, if not millions of people, that are dying of uh, diseases to which there is cure and to which there is treatment. Many infectious diseases, like malaria and TB, that have been eradicated in many modern countries are still epidemics in many other countries. And uh, for me, as a person, it's unacceptable and immoral that somebody anywhere in the world will die of a disease to which there is a cure. It just means that the means to cure the disease are not available to these people. Whether it's the government, whether it's the lack of cooperation, whether it's money, whether it's anything else. But the knowledge is there and people are still dying. And something should be done in order to take the achievements of science and make them available to all the population of the world. And in my opinion, this is probably the greatest challenge of medicine these days. Thank you very much indeed, and not least, Jeanette. Thank you. I think that um, there are two points of view that I'd like to add. From a government uh, point of view, I think that the biggest challenge right now is how do you provide equitable access to quality services with financial protection to all citizens in, in, in your country? That is what we call uh, universal uh, health coverage. And from a global perspective, I think that the, the, global, the biggest global challenge, which is quite dramatic, is how are we going to get to survive 
as a global species this century. I think that there are clear indications that the chances of survival are much less than 100%. And I think that's the biggest challenge, what Richard calls uh, planetary health. Thank you very much, Jeanette. So, um, you've heard some different views expressed here, and so great opportunity for you to probe some of these views in more detail. I'd like you to raise your hands, please, and uh, say who you are. And are we providing microphones to speakers? Tobias? So, please raise your hands, say who you are, and a microphone will find you. Yes, please, right on the front row. On the front row here. Tobias, can we get the microphone? Microphone. Oh, it, oh, I think you have to go to the microphone. I'm sorry. The microphone can't go to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to follow up uh, on two of the speakers, uh, Professor Hota and, I mean, the last one is long, so I'll say A, Professor Aaron. Um, that education is very important. And then I'm coming from Ghana, so I'm speaking for Africa. Because uh, when it comes to health, we see that uh, the biggest uh, obstacle is uh, ignorance. There are quite a lot of things that uh, we are not aware of. And then if we are aware of, it's also you look at the inequalities you know, and equities, justice that exists in the economic environment access to medical equipment, diagnostic facilities, and as Professor Aaron said, it's so sad that somebody will die when you know that there's a cure for that ailment. So for me, my question is, how can we work together, bring in knowledge, research, and then accountability between Europe and the developing world so that uh, many people can be cured of simple ailments where there is uh, the availability of drugs so that we can also improve the minimum life for people on the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's an extraordinarily important question. And um, just so everybody in the room is aware that you are the Minister of Health from Ghana, and uh, so you speak with um, huge authenticity when you raise these questions about what can we practically do to address lack of access and lack of awareness and ignorance. Now, who'd like to start? Yes, Detlev. Indeed, I mean, I fully agree. I didn't mention that in my primary statement, but education, education, education is the best vaccination. There's no doubt about that. And all the behaviors which John mentioned and, and many other things, of course, follow uh, education. So this is, you know, kind of the top question. Uh, let me say what, what we try to do at the World Health Summit. Uh, we have the World Health Summit, as you know, is organized by the so-called M8 Alliance. These are major uh, health centers around the world of the G8, G20 countries uh, and universities, but also all national academies are part of the IMP organization. So we have an umbrella organization for the organization of the World Health Summit, which I feel is unique for such an infrastructure of a meeting. And we are preparing papers, recommendations, statements, which are being discussed at the meeting, and then via the national academies go to each individual government and to the international organizations, trying to set the agenda and uh, accomplish changes in attitudes and policies and governance and so on. 
So one of the papers being discussed here is a paper of, which is prepared by IMP, actually already ratified by IMP, on research capacity building in low and middle income countries. Exactly what you are saying. And uh, this will go to the international organizations. We will be happy to provide it to you. And I think jointly, we, can, we have to mobilize national governments, regional governments, but also World Bank and other organizations to step in and uh, do what we feel they have to do for one of the most important topics of, of mankind, and that is individual health and health of societies and education. And research capacity building, of course, is, is many aspects. So this will be discussed in the symposium, but uh, the, the, the kind of the condition to establish that is education in the area. Who else would like to try and address this question? Jeanette. Yeah, well, Ghana is uh, an example, in fact, of, of, of some of the advances, and you are going to be celebrating the 10 years of the National Health Insurance in November. So, so Ghana has shown that a country can, in fact, advance. You have two things that are quite important. One, the introduction of the specific uh, uh, taxes for, for alcohol, and tobacco that is used to provide financial protection for your citizens, and secondly, your, of course, your National Health Insurance Agency. But the thing is that I think that more than the role of science, I think that donors and the global community, they have a role to play, basically getting the act, our act together, because sometimes we interfere in country progress by targeting our specific interest without taking into account the interest of the country and without integrating our work with the country. So I would say that we have a big role to play as donors and contributors, and I think that the scientists have a role to play which is basically tune science to the real needs of the people and translate science to the real needs of the people in terms of the population health, not in terms of individual needs, but in terms of the health of the population. That would be my response. Very good, thank you. Any, any other contributions to this specific question? Yes, please. No, no, no. John. Um, uh, Minister, I, I would uh, probably share that um, I think there are a few key ingredients uh, the first, um, uh, as everyone has alluded to, is education. But education by itself will not succeed without good governance. So I think it is critical for every country, for every organization, essentially to have strong, good governance, because without that, the best of policies can never be implemented. So once you, we have institutions of good governance, and once we have a commitment to education, then the realization that we are all on the same boat. The boat is planet Earth, and no part of the world is immune from what happens in another part of the world. And it is bringing the five key threads who are present at this World Health Summit. Policy makers, such as yourself and colleagues, academia, represented by the M8 Alliance and other universities, industry, the media, all sitting here, and civic society. Once you get all five threads realizing that we're all on the same boat together, then there is no difference whether a problem exists in your country or my country, because whatever happens in your country will affect my country and vice versa. Uh, I think once we have that in place, then we are perhaps better suited for a long-term solution because ultimately it has to be something that we constantly work at. It cannot be something that changes whenever, whenever governments go to, go to the polls because it must be something which is inbuilt into society and it carries through and not dependent on political cycles. Thanks very much, John. We have time for one. Oh, please, yes. I want to add something, and that is the role of uh, industrialized countries, or traditionally called donor countries. 
uh, I refer to ODA, Overseas Development uh, Assistance. Even uh, up to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, so uh, presumably even up to the time when it, the world economy was doing reasonably well, in spite of uh, numerous appeals by the United Nations to rich countries to increase their uh, contribution to ODA to at least 0.7%, 0.7% is nothing of your GDP. And yet, after decades of this uh, campaign, education, only five uh, small countries in Europe have come up with 0.7 or up to 1%, and that's Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Not a single EU country uh, outside of this, not the uh, US, Japan, Republic of Korea, or why not the rich oil and mineral resource country? Why wouldn't Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, join with the rest of OECD in also contributing 0.7% of oil and gas revenues for ODA? Then there were pledges you know, in a special uh, events uh, in uh, Scotland, you know, uh, pushed by public civil society like Bono and many others. And uh, hardly ever even those pledges made in the floodlight of uh, media, cons, public, cons were ever met. Then in 2009, I was still president of my country. I was sitting there in the, in the UN General Assembly listening to the speeches of all the major powers, and each and every one said the following. ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, will not suffer, will not be penalized by the economic financial crisis. And yet, since then, every single rich country with ODA have uh, drastically reduced their uh, contribution, uh, their uh, support to ODA. Everyone significantly reduced. So, in view of that, I'm extremely skeptical that new resources will be found to, uh, for health, for education in the developing countries that need it. Of course, developing countries that have failed cannot blame only the rich countries. Both sides have to ask questions our, ourselves. The rich countries, why, after 40 years of ODA, extreme poverty, lack of access to clean water, preventable diseases, malaria, dengue, hardly diminish. What's wrong in terms of uh, uh, prioritizing and managing this ODA, and what's wrong with us in developing countries that uh, after so much aid, or that nothing much change, or really the so-called uh, aid really came to our respective countries, or it was actually mostly spent on reports, studies, evaluations, etc., etc. And little money in the end end up in the recipient country, in rural development, and so on. So I uh, have to say, you know, uh, I'm an, uh, an eternal optimist, but sometimes I prefer to surrender to the realism, the realism of the fact that uh, uh, I don't see the rich countries going to uh, uh, increase ODA for developing countries. And what is extraordinary, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, amazing how so easy for the European Central Bank, for uh, IMF, to find billions of dollars within a matter of weeks to rescue banks 
or to industries or entire countries. And yet over the years, we always hear how difficult for such and such countries to find money for ODA, for developing countries. But then suddenly you have this 2008, 2009 crisis that happened started by the rich in the US, in England, not us, we didn't cause it. And we even have money in uh, US uh, uh, treasury bonds. All of Timor less than money from the oil revenues are in US treasury. I'm from East Timor, for those of you who don't know, we have a bit of money, oil, gas, and what we did, we set up a petroleum fund and consider the best managers in Asia, this petroleum fund, and we put all the revenues, now about $15 billion, in U.S. Treasury bonds. Well, when I watch the stupidity of uh, the debate in the U.S. Congress, and uh, I ask where is going to, what's going to happen to our money? And uh, so anyway, uh, I stop here for the time being. <laughs> well, that's a very salutary note. I'm afraid, I appreciate that others have, might have questions, but I've been passed a note to say that the next session starts here at 1 o'clock and we have to finish exactly at 12.55, which is now. So please, I'd like to thank our excellent speakers and panel. Thank you for coming uh, this lunchtime. Great appreciation. Round of applause for you. Thank you. <laughs>